I'm really excited about this next speaker. He is currently Senior Policy Fellow at the UC Riverside School of Public Policy. He founded the Center for Technology, Society, and Policy at UC Riverside. And when I originally met him, um, he, from 2002 to 2008, he served in the State Assembly representing the West San Fernando Valley. And we were talking about beforehand, he was the energetic one. He was the fun office. He understood that public service is, is not a drag. Public service is fun. Public service is what we all dream about doing, and that you can do it in an exciting way. And I don't remember him touching technology back then. Um, he did. Clearly, I didn't work directly for him. But um, you bring that energy with you, and I think that's what today's about. So I'm really excited to hear what he's got for us. So please welcome the Honorable Lloyd Levine. Thanks. We on? You hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. I appreciate it. It's an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to talk to you. I, I am so thrilled to be at this important, timely, and dare I say, exciting conference. Something you usually don't talk about with regards to conferences. But technology is exciting, and I'm excited to be here. Um, I did do technology in the legislature. Um, I, my first important bill was actually um, very wonky, but ended up becoming the cornerstone for Governor Schwarzenegger's broadband task force, which I later served on, and that was to streamline the siting of telecommunications, high-speed telecommunications equipment on state property. Uh, I went on to, and I'll touch on that a little bit later in my remarks, uh, revamp the technology procurement process for schools. Uh, that's actually some of the stuff that's now in the proposals for the Office of Digital Innovation, how we're going to change the way we procure technology at the state level. Um, I did DIVCA, which is a, a acronym for the Digital Infrastructure Video Competition Act, which hastened the deployment of broadband throughout the state. So there was a number of others as well that I worked on, so I don't want to think I didn't do it. I, there's a, I have a lengthy background in technology. I love technology. Um, I'm an early adopter of pretty much anything. I'm fascinated by it. Um, I, I remember getting Bluetooth headsets when they were you know, wired and that was, everybody was like, wow, that was the most amazing thing. I drove, was one of the first early adopters of electric vehicles. And I am here today to talk about changing state government. We need to do it. Everybody in this room knows we can do better than we are doing now. So I am currently, through my, my uh, role at UC Riverside, actually working on a book on technology and government. It's going to be published in uh, December, if any of you are interested. And we just finished the title. The editors, the publishers, and I just finalized the title. I came up with it as I was having a, a conversation with, uh, with somebody one day. But I didn't know I actually came up with the title until the next morning where I do all of my great thinking in the shower. I'm like, wait a minute. That's the title. The title of the book is Technology Versus Government, The Irresistible Force Meets the Immovable Object. OK, I'm feeling good about the title now. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, the, um, and that is my jumping off point today for my discussion, my talk. So technology obviously is the irresistible force. And as we all know, technology is changing everything in society. It ran headlong over the newspaper industry and the magazine industry. It is eliminated record stores, a vestige of my youth, a social activity to go to the record store. Nobody says, hey, let's go visit Amazon together. But we used to spend hours flipping through the bins and record stores. Those of you who are too young to remember, look it up. It's on the internet, just like everything else. Um, the retail industry has completely been decimated or is in the middle of being decimated. We see shopping malls around the country closing. I recently saw the number of shopping malls there used to be and the number there are now, and they are el el eliminating them quickly. Um, but what about government? So far, I'd call it a standoff. Technology hasn't run over government. Government hasn't moved. We're kind of staring at each other, trying to figure out where we're going to go. Certainly, there's far more technology in government today than there was five or 10 years ago. But there's far less technology in government and far less newer technology in government than any private sector enterprise. Tesla makes cars that drive themselves. They might have a few issues with them. But Tesla, for all intents and purposes, makes cars that drive themselves. My car, I drive a Chevy Volt. It can parallel park itself. No hands on the wheel. Push a button. It's great. The DMV doesn't take credit cards. <laughs> I 
I can use Alexa to talk to my house and not sound like a crazy person. Alexa, turn on the music. Alexa, turn on the backyard lights. Alexa, what's the weather like today? Alexa, buy the paper towels. Government, we can text 911 now. That's about the same, right? Yeah. That's the same. Um, it's been said that technology is advancing at an unprecedented pace. And it certainly seems that way, right? Is there anybody who's going to disagree with that premise? I'm going to disagree with that premise, but I just figured I'd throw it out there and see if anybody else wants to. What if it isn't? I don't think it actually is. I think it's progressing the same way technology usually progresses. It seems quick because we are living in that time. But think about it. The first commercial website didn't launch until 1991, and nobody could access it because they didn't have internet access for the most part. Widespread dial-up service wasn't available until 1994-95. Amazon did not make its first sale until 1995. I bought stuff that year, book. It was great. Jeff Bezos used to pack the packages himself in his garage, true story, and you'd get a gift. I had a mouse pad that was in one of the packages and a bookmark. It was, it was great. Um, they don't do that anymore. Um, commercial and residential broadband didn't start really until 2002, 2003. And could anyone raise your hand? Who knows when the first iPhone was available? Let's make this interactive. Go ahead, Peter. Close, 2008. First iPhones weren't available until two, maybe late 2007. And as I recall, it was 2008. And at that time, a bunch of assembly members wanted them. And there was this battle between the assembly members who really wanted the new technology and the people who ran technology for the legislature. Like, we can't do that. Security risk, every excuse in the world. And you know what happened? They went around it. Fine, I'm just going to use this. We'll just do it unofficially. We're not going to hook it up to the government's websites, and we're all good to go. And it, even though the iPhone was available in 2008, it wasn't until 2011 where it was available for any other system other than Apple, I mean, other than AT&T. So if you think about that, that's not that long ago. That's eight years. So if you are 10 years old today, you were born before the iPhone was widespread, uh, adopted in a wide fashion way. That was an awkward sentence. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Think about other, uh, self-deprecating speaker, um, think about other, other industries in history. Think about how far the automobile had come in the first 10, 15, or 25 years. Ford Motor Company is 116 years old today. It was founded in 1903. Imagine what it looked like in 1919. So maybe we're not so far. Perhaps technology is advancing quickly, but we are still in the infancy. We've probably, in my view, just begun to scratch the surface of what's available. So. The scary and sobering thought for me and for everyone who's involved here today with government is that technology is in its infancy and we are already that far behind. We are already that far behind that we've just, literally just recently allowed people to text 911. Despite us being the home of Facebook, Google, Cisco, some of the biggest technology companies in the world, from my perspective, much of government still treats technology like it's 1999, not 2019. And I want to say, before I, I go on, I want to state on the record, I am a believer in government. I am not the kind of person who serves in government and bashes government. I hate that. We need government. Government protects us. It sets the rules for us to live together by. We have millions of people, 40 million people in California. Most of us live very close together. We need government. Government mediates between competing liberties. It provides us the foundation by which we, we create society. These are essential tasks. But if government in California and other places don't figure out how to integrate technology more smoothly, we run the risk of suffering the same fate as those other industries. And this may sound like hyperbole, but I do not believe it is. We run the risk of some degree of unplanned irrelevance or obsolescence if we can't get on board with technology. And I see two profound implications looming for government in the next decade as we begin to, it's, uh, to seek as that, as it seeks to provide the vast array of services that we provide in state government. And I can't tell you all of them, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different services that the government provides. And the other thing that people don't think about, at least not that I've encountered, is as we seek to attract and retain the next generation of employees. So the current generation is called Generation Z, for those of you who didn't know. I don't think they planned very well in advance when they started with Gen X. They didn't leave themselves a lot of room there, but I said, OK, I have an idea. And I looked and I did a little research and you know, contacted a few people who know these things. And I, I'm trying to dub the next generation Gen T, the technology generation. What is Gen T? In my mind, Gen T 
is the group of people who are probably about in high school now who have led their entire lives completely surrounded by technology. Now, you may think we're there, you may see everybody around you, but these the individuals who have been entirely surrounded by technology their whole lives, they're just trickling into the workforce. They have not entered in mass yet. The current generation, in high, the, the high, current high school generation is, I believe, the first generation that has never lived without near ubiquitous technology. They're the ones who are never gonna remember a time before smartphones. By about 2025, they're going to, the, the young workforce is gonna be populated by those people who never existed in a time without full penetration of broadband, at least in urban areas, and full smartphone penetration. That isn't to say, by the way, that many of us in the current generation aren't frustrated at the pace government adopts technology. My first computer in 1987, divulging a little bit of how old I am, but you could also Google that, it had an amber screen, it had a true floppy disk before they went to those little five, you know, smaller hard ones that they still called floppy. Um, and at the height, at the time, it was the height of technology, it had a bi-directional dot matrix printer. How many of you ever used a dot matrix printer? Oh, that's actually far more than I thought. <laughs> how many of you used one for printing out Word documents and not filling out forms that still require a dot matrix printer? And the hands, the far fewer hands went up for that. So for those of you who don't remember, the first dot matrix printers went zzzt, zzzt. The new ones went zzz, zzz, you doubled your time. Or you cut your time in half as to how long it took to print. Gives you an idea of how far technology has come since 1990, uh, 1987. I didn't have a, a, a cell phone until I was in grad school, and even then I was in a small minority. Now I'm on college campuses uh, you know, all the time, and you just can't see anybody who isn't walking around doing this. Um, and that's not, no, I'm not, not criticizing them, I'm just, it's an observation. That's the way society is today. Um, but I adopted and adapted quickly. However, I still don't engage in the world entirely digitally. I still don't do that. I can put away my phone, I can put away my devices, my phone and computer are down there and I'm not twitching. Um, and should push come to shove, when I'm doing my research papers, I could still use the Dewey Decimal System if I needed to. Those of you who aren't sure what the Dewey Decimal System is, look that up too. Um, Generation T is different. They have spent their entire lives engaging with the world through technology. They engage through laptops, smartphones, iPads, and who knows what comes next. Um, we did skip the Get Smart shoe phone, but maybe that will come back. Um, they also engage through Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, text message, and again, who knows what the next thing is that they're going to use there. They don't call each other without a barrage of text messages first, then someone might break the chain and call. If you call a Gen T without texting first, they're gonna ask who died. One thing Gen T does better than anybody else, I gotta say, is they take video and pictures of everything and they share it all online. In some way, they are the world's greatest documentarians. Archaeologists in the future are gonna have a treasure trove of daily life. But they get entertainment online, they get their news online, they buy everything online, they do their homework digitally. They do everything online and importantly, that is the way they expect the world to be. That is the way they expect the world will be. And if it isn't that way, they will go somewhere else. If I can't engage digitally with you, I'm gonna go over here because you will meet my needs. And that's the way of, of, of the future. We may not like it in government, but that's the way it's gonna be. So contrast that with the current state of technology adoption and implementation by governments. A quick Google search, this is not really difficult to do, will show you page after page and article after article of how government gets it wrong, cost overruns, significant delays, purchasing the wrong technology. LA Unified School District, I am looking at you. Um, those of you who giggled get it, those of you who didn't, it was a debacle of epic proportions. So the question is, if this Gen T can't engage with government in the same digital way that the rest of the engage with the rest of the world, what will that look like? How will they seek services? How will they participate in civic life? When choosing a workplace, will they choose to work at a place that prizes the latest technology and supports upgrades and integration, or will they work for the government? This generation wants to make a difference, as was said in the introduction. They do. I am on college campuses all the time. I lecture to undergrads. I lecture to graduate students in multiple types of classes as well. It's not just the public policy majors. This generation coming up has a passion to improve the world. But what will they be able to do that through government? Will government be able to attract and retain the best and the brightest of, of those students with that desire who are entering the workforce looking for a different, cult, a different change of culture from current government? 
The rest of the world has one culture, government has another, they're gonna face a choice. I call it the government digital divide. It's not that the government doesn't have technology, it's a different kind of technology. So the key question, the key question for me, and the one I'm sure everybody here in this room has asked at some point is, why? What is it about government and technology that makes it so difficult? To get the answer, you'll have to buy my book. Kidding. Um, I know. Um, but it comes down to three things for me, I, I think. I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of reasons. There's lots of reasons, but I only have a brief period of time up here to talk. Um, so I think it's three things. It's culture, it's complexity, and it's a fear of failure. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe later today I will learn something new. Maybe somebody will come up and tell me a new reason, but these are the things that I feel are true. We do not have a culture in government that supports technology innovation or change within most governmental entities I have dealt with. But I'm not gonna dwell on culture today. Culture is nebulous and very hard to change. And in my opinion, it's a product of complexity and a fear of failure, and it is something that will change as other things change. Complexity is a huge problem. And it's one that can't just be laid at the feet of government. Technology is incredibly complex for most people. Most people, and I think, I think of all the people, <laughs> never hit your chest when you're wearing a chest mic. Um, most, I, the, I think of people I know in the world who don't do what I do, who don't do what we do in here. A lot of them are afraid of technology. They're afraid they're gonna break it somehow. And I'm not just talking about dropping it, just simply using it, I might break it. I think about my parents and their smartphones that they just got. What you have to remember is government is, and I don't mean this in a negative way, is made up of normal people, everyday people. In the bell curve of life, there are early adopters, but there are, those people are generally outliers. There are, those are people who are willing to take a risk. But those people with, I would say, two standard deviations of the mean adoption time aren't aggressively seeking out the latest technologies. People who are slow to implement and adopt at home, who wait years for things to have been tested, are not willing to take the same risks as the rest of us. They're, that is their, what I term, their personal technology culture. We all have our own personal technology culture as well as the larger culture. And this is true regardless of employee. Agency secretaries, department directors, you know, all the way down to the lowest level employees, we all have different levels of technology, culture and technology engagement. And complexity leads to the second pro problem under complexity, adaption, adaptation. People in government have jobs to do and programs to administer, and I don't need to tell those of you in government here that. They are not looking to learn new systems, and to them it's actually an annoying inconvenience. There are caseloads to administer, parking meters to check, and any of the other thousands and thousands and thousands of tasks that I referred to earlier. I remember my first job in state government in 1995. I learned a lot from that job, and some of those lessons I still carry with me today. I worked for, this is a whole other lesson, but I'll give it to you. I worked for the Mass Layoff Statistics Unit of the Labor Market Information Division of the Employment Development Department, jointly funded by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. My business card was this big. Um, but really, there were some great, great people who worked there, people who I became friends with and stayed friends with for a long time. I don't remember how many people there were there, but a good couple of hundred in the office. And it was the early days, quote unquote, of technology. We all had computers, because it was a big government office. We all had computers with broadband internet access. I don't remember exactly how long I worked there, a year to two years, something like that, and then I moved on to work for the legislature before I ran for office. Um, but I can also remember the computers were upgraded during the time I was there, and I don't know how, how often they were, but what I remember vividly was that not one person there was excited when the email came from tech support that the computers were gonna be upgraded. Not one person had the same attitude towards those upgrades as they do to the new iPhones and the new Samsung Galaxies today. No one was excited to see what the new features were gonna be. To them, it just meant, okay, well there's gonna be three or four or five hours or a day lost where I'm not gonna be doing the program that I was hired to do. I also learned something fundamental, and this is, this is probably you know, something you learn, you, you misunderstand as youth and learn as you get older. Um, and, and it's gonna come up again a little bit, so I, and I'm getting towards the end here in case you're worried about my timing. Um, but I, you know, I, I learned that at about five o'clock the building was empty, and this was not a culture I'd ever experienced. This was my first real office job, and I was naive. I will freely admit that, I was naive. I was in my 20s, I was single, I had no kids, and I just didn't quite understand. But as I have gotten older, engaged with the world more, understood people more, what I've come to realize is that not everybody is like me. Not everybody is like many of you in this room. The people I worked with were incredibly hardworking, dedicated people. 
but it was also a job. It wasn't necessarily their passion, and it wasn't their company. They weren't paid to stay late. They would stay late when they needed to, but most of them had lives to get home to. They had kids to feed, soccer practices to take the kids to, uh, you know, all, the whole panoply of things that we do after work that now that I have kids and I'm older, I understand better. And I, I, I was never mean. I just, it was a perception that I went through, like, oh, now, now I, I get it. So when we think about technology and government, we need to think about those users. How fast can those users learn? How much easier will it make their job? How quickly, smoothly, and seamlessly can the change be made? User-centered design, and that's something we're going to hear a lot about today, is a very important concept. And it needs to apply to both the users of government services and those in government who provide those services. They are users too. Every single one of you in this room who works for a department or an agency who uses computers and technology, you are users, and the design needs to take you into account as well, not just the customers you serve. And this is where complexity and the myriad of tasks done by government that I referenced above and user-centered design converge, and it provides a good transition to my final point, the fear of failure. In government, my impression is people are afraid to fail. You get fired for failing. You don't get fired for not failing. But what about this concept? What if by not failing, we're failing in a different way? We're failing to achieve our potential. What if Roger Bannister never tried to break the four minute mile? Well, he failed to achieve his potential. He never failed to break the four minute mile, but he failed to achieve his potential. I'm a runner, running geek, by the way. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a real world example real quick here. You know, a number of years ago, those of you who are from Sacramento know, the Sacramento almost lost the Kings, and they wanted a new arena to keep the Kings in town. City Council got on board, and one of the ways that we were going to do keep the Kings was we were going to finance the new arena by leveraging our parking revenues. So I have a friend who owns a bunch of parking lots here in Sacramento and a bunch of parking lots in San Francisco, and he wanted to bid on the contract. And so he came up with this proposal, and he gave it to me to review. I'm the government guy. I'm the technology guy. I review this. And early on in the proposal, somewhere in the, in the executive summary, there was something about innovation. Now, my first response, my knee-jerk response was, it's parking. How innovative is parking, really? I, like, what, are you going to use a different kind of paint to paint the lines? I mean, come on. But as I read it, there were some really innovative things in there that I don't remember now, but I was, I was impressed with the level of innovation and integration in the different parking systems and services. Like, great. But here's the other thing that I took away from this, is there was nothing in that proposal that could not have been implemented by the city of Sacramento that day. They didn't need him to come in with the innovation. The only difference is, I, in my mind, I played out the scenario. And I assumed that somewhere in one of the city office buildings, there was the director of parking services for the Sacramento. Hardworking, dedicated public servant who really does his job well, or her job well. Makes six figures, good benefits, great retirement, good life. And in my scenario, it's mine, you can create your own. He, he or she has a spouse that has a, is similarly situated. So you're making 200,000, you've got great benefits, good retirement, that is a good living in Sacramento. There is no incentive for this person to rock the boat. No in incentive for them to say, hey, boss, I have an idea. Because if their idea fails, then they get fired. But if you, fail, if you don't try anything, then you haven't failed, or you haven't failed in a visible way. So the other thing that applies to government that doesn't apply, by and large, to private sectors is there are no watchdogs for the most part looking at the technology adaption of, say, AT&T or any host of other things. In government, if we fail, we've got political opponents, we've got the media, we've got a whole host of groups waiting to pounce and say, ha ha, and they're going to run against you or campaign for your job or try and get you fired or whatever it might be. We get a $500 million cost over, overrun, five-year delay. It gets blasted around the state reinforces the perception that government can't do technology, creates a climate where we're afraid to try something new, and we rigorously adhere to the process. But what if that process doesn't work? What if that process gets us where we are today? You can adhere to it. Well, I followed the process. I shouldn't be fired. I followed the process. But that process isn't leading to the kind of innovations and the kind of changes we need. We have to break that cycle. We have to create a culture where it's OK to fail. I'm not saying we want to fail, but we have to create a culture where it's okay to fail so that we can try new things. 
Without the ability to fail, we get slow incremental changes that fail to keep pace with society at large. So the million dollar question is how do we mitigate complexity, change the culture, and accept that failure is okay? It starts at the top. It starts at the top. At Google, as many of you know, project teams who fail uh, pro project teams who fail and kill their own project actually get bonuses. They are hauled up on stage in Project X and lauded for their failures because it means they tried something and you won't accomplish something without trying something. Agency secretaries, department directors, and managers and leaders across the board from state and local government need to give their employees the confidence to try new things, to innovate, and to bring up new ideas and approaches. That is where the culture starts. It's a culture I tried to create in my office. My staff had the freedom to suggest ideas. It might not work, but suggest it. There's nothing wrong. The worst somebody's going to say is no. And if we're going to fail, let's fail small, fail quickly, and move on. Let's not award massive contracts to companies that take 10 years and countless change orders to fulfill. There are millions of different services provided by government and in the programs it administers. Some can be run with Office 365 in a secure cloud system. Others take purpose-built software, but if we can break the purchases of both hardware and software down into smaller chunks and not take a one-size-fits-all approach, we're more likely to, to succeed. Technology companies themselves need to be part of this solution. You are providing, and I'm speaking to those from technology here, you are providing solutions that need, and need to focus on customer needs and understand human nature, not just the behavior of those in the technology industry. Focus not just on the product, the app, or the software, but focus on transition and implementation. You will know more about your product, and you will know it far better than the people who are using your product. How are you going to create a product that eases their transition from the old technology to the new technology, that minimizes downtime and inconvenience, that is different from the way we have always done it? The culture of change isn't going to happen because of intentional action. You can't really plan for a culture change. The culture of technology in the state will change because of the other factors that I addressed. None of these changes are going to take place without work. Inertia is a powerful, powerful force, and we need to overcome it. We need to be organized in a goal and a message. We have to take to the halls of the legislature and talk to the administration. We will have to make our case over and over again because you are going up against the status quo. However, I'm hopeful that the time is right. We have in the governor's office the man who wrote Citizenville and who proposed the Office of Digital Innovation to lead these efforts. If there is ever a receptive governor and a receptive administration, it is this one. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the day as we all share ideas, listen to one another, hear from some of the brightest minds in business and in government, and we chart a path forward together. My admonition is this. Remember the people in addition to the technology. Remember the workers who will use the products, as well as the customers who will interface with it. To be successful, technology needs to be about both the user and the technology. As I said at the beginning, technology is the irresistible force, and it is barreling down on the immovable object that is government. Gov Generation T is coming, and we need to do better. Thank you.